Hello everyone, we are Team Cold Spoon from Singapore, comprising myself, Ray Han, and John Kenneth. In this presentation, we will be discussing the strategies we'll be using and the rationale behind them for the RoboCup Junior Rescue Simulation 2021. So let me start with a short intro about the team. The three of us are part of Raffles Institution's Club Automatica, and we have participated in various Coast Space competitions since last year, including the Virtual RoboCup Asia Pacific 2020 and the RoboCup Singapore Opens in both 2020 and 2021, although we've all entered these as individuals and not as one team. Now, onto the actual strategy, which we've actually split into three main sections, basic movement, directed movement, and scoring. I'll be talking about the first section, basic movement, Rehan will talk about the second and third sections, and John Kenneth will take you through our discussion and conclusion. So, what is basic movement? Basically, we term this to refer to the general navigation of the robot around the map. Using OpenCV, we can analyze screenshots of the map and identify and mark out the various components of the map. Using this information, we then calculate movement vectors to act on the robot. Attractive in nature for the positive components, like objects and bonus zones, and repulsive for the components that we want to avoid, such as traps, obstacles, and the edge of the map. This allows the robot to move around the map and search for objects organically, without running into obstacles or traps. However, since this calculation of vectors also requires the current position of the robot, it will not work in signal loss zones, where the current position is given as 0, 0. To ensure we don't generate incorrect vectors in these zones, the actual position of the robot must be calculated through extrapolation. This is done by looking at the speed inputs on both the left wheel and the right wheel and multiplying by the time interval to obtain the final displacement of the robot. This means we preserve the functionality of the vectors as well as other movement functions such as coordinate targeting, which we will cover later on. We actually did quite a bit of research and testing to find the actual distance covered by the robot per unit time for every given speed value, but I won't really go into the details right now. In addition to all of this, we still decided to maintain a backup in the form of a wall avoid function, which assumes priority over the vectors when the robot goes too close to an obstacle. This function makes the robot turn away from a wall at a rate proportional to its distance from the wall, and towards the direction there's more space, which is determined by comparing the left and right ultrasonic readings. This ensures that the bot can also maneuver through tight spaces and prevent collisions with obstacles. The second contributor to navigation is coordinate targeting, in which the robot directs itself towards a specific coordinate when instructed. The angle at which the target coordinate is relative to the robot's current position is then calculated using trigonometry. Proportional steering is used where the robot turns faster the larger the angle between the direction it is currently facing and the direction that it needs to go in. The function is used for the robot to seek out deposit zones and super objects since both components of the map offer discrete coordinates that the robot can be instructed to target. Additionally, since there may be multiple coordinates available to be targeted, the robot will calculate the Euclidean distance between itself and all the points and prioritize the closest one first. This particular moment of steering is combined with the steering due to factors in a weighted average which allows for targeting of specific coordinates while simultaneously maintaining its ability to effectively navigate through the obstacles of the map. For our scoring strategy, we chose to target a collection of sets of two red, two black, and two sun objects, or a set of RRBBCC. To preface this discussion, here's a brief look at the super object system. When a set of one red, one black, and one sun object, or a set of RPC, is deposited, a super object worth a base value of 90 points is generated, while a super plus object with a base value of 180 points is generated when a set of RRBBCC is deposited. Considering the points from both picking up and depositing, the super object variants are worth 180 and 360 points respectively. From the chart, the points on offer when depositing the set of RRBBCC is far greater than any other set due to the additional 360 bonus points from the super plus object, hence justifying aiming for this as a general guideline. However, a case where all objects are readily available throughout the run is unlikely to occur in reality, especially in 1v1 scenarios where object depletion is greatly accelerated. Hence, this combination is only set as a rough guideline instead of an absolute one, allowing the robot to target other combinations when it is more efficient to do so. Strategy aside, the scoring actions also involve picking up normal and super objects. For normal objects, 
The code to pick up will be executed once a value within a set range of RGB values is detected by the color sensors. The robot will then attempt to pick up regardless of how close it actually is to the object, which greatly improves its consistency in picking up objects. The case is very different for super objects. Since only their position on the map is known, the robot will rely on calculating the distance between it and the object to determine when to pick up instead of checking the color sensors. Within a certain radius of the object, the robot will slow down to allow for more precise alterations to its current bearing, and when it is within a target distance of the object, it will attempt to pick up. To reduce the time spent collecting each super object, the program will wait until there are 4 super objects on the map, or when there is only 1 minute remaining to search for the super objects before collecting all of them in one go. Additionally, to speed up the deposit process, once either color sensor detects the orange floor of a deposit zone, the robot will turn in that direction quickly to maneuver into the zone. This will continue until both color sensors detect the near exact RGB values of the orange floor to ensure that the deposit will not fail. Moving on to our learning experience. This competition provided us a great platform to learn more advanced concepts in robotics and apply them in various ways to accomplish our objectives. We learned the importance of writing efficient code when working on features that required a lot of time and computing power to execute. Vector map generation involved many repeated calculations on a given set of pixels. Hence, the majority of the time was spent on trying out different techniques to reduce the time it took to generate the maps as well as implementing it with the robot's movement and strategy. Working with the new rescue simulator also proved to be a major challenge, especially with the new physics engine, as many basic functions that had worked previously now had to be modified to prevent the robot from doing wheelies, drifting off the map, and toppling over while still remaining the original functionality. When trying to implement new features into our code, we often encountered many bugs and errors that would cause the robot to behave in an unintended manner. In order to fix these issues, we use logical reasoning and critical thinking to break the problems apart into its individual components and piece together the most effective solutions. This usually involved extensive troubleshooting to identify the source of the problem and testing out different ideas until we found the best one. Apart from all the technical knowledge that we have gained, this competition also allowed us to develop soft skills, such as effective communication when discussing various ideas and strategies with one another. Additionally, the limited time we had to complete the development of our code improved our time management skills, allowing us to work more effectively under such time constraints. In conclusion, the current program is highly effective and reliable in a single-player scenario, but it can still be affected by object depletion in 1v1 scenarios. Therefore, more can be done in terms of further optimizing the robot's navigation of the map. For example, a shortest path algorithm like Dijkstra's algorithm or the A-star search algorithm could be used to determine the fastest route that the robot can take to reach a certain point. This can greatly improve the flexibility and efficiency of coordinate targeting, especially in difficult maps with more obstacles. Additionally, despite its advantages, the scoring strategy described earlier may not be the perfect solution to object depletion and random object spawning. More work should be directed towards developing a highly responsive and efficient system that can easily adapt to the ever-changing simulated environment. That's all from us. Thank you for your attention and have a great day.